Buckle your seatbelt, strap on your helmet, take your protein pills, because what you're about to watch is a collection of the videos that chronicled the PEI immigration protests and the subsequent protests that popped up across Canada as a result. This video starts with the very end of this whole saga in which PPC leader Maxime Bernier confronts Rupinder Singh Paul, the leader of the PEI protesters. This has been quite a long saga. It also covers CELA, uh, that would be the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, how they lobby to actually increase mass immigration. I think you can imagine why they would want to do that. This is quite a wild ride, and it's also a reflection of where we need to go as a country because we are in serious trouble. Congratulations to PEI for standing their ground. Because if they didn't, not only would it have been very bad for PEI, it would have set a very bad precedent for all the other provinces and territories. So sit back and enjoy. Nice to no, stay. Now you can stay, but when they're going to be expired. We will and see some, at that moment. Yeah, but what I'm saying, if some of you have their permit that they, are expired. Nobody standing nobody here, here, have, nobody is here is illegal. They your, have their permits. But in your group of 100 people. Nobody that is expired. And, and, if they would have been expired, they would have been deported. Okay, but they will be deported when it be expired. You're this is what? No. Doing, no, because no they won't said, be deported. You just said that when you're going to be expired, they will be deported. They will be legalizing their stay. No deportation will be needed in that moment. Uh, but we will need deportation. That's why I you need to have full knowledge. You are a leader. I think you should have a full knowledge a full before no, you get no, no, here. I have a full knowledge. This I'm saying when like the it. permit is expired, you must be deported. You're saying my permit is expired. It isn't. No, no. If it's not, but it will be in a couple of weeks or in a couple I of months. I can extend it. But I, I hope they won't because we don't need <laughs> they you. They will. The, no, we don't need you here in this country. How can you decide it? Because For example, they, listen they, to there's me. Canadians, listen. there's young Canadians no, 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 that can me. work at Tim Horton. We then they can, I'm not working. At well, it looks as though we just might have a glimmer of hope for the flaming dumpster fire that is Canada's immigration policy. By now, I'm sure that you're well aware of the protests being carried out by the Indian community living in PEI. These protests were triggered when PEI announced a 25% reduction in work permits to curb the insane influx of new arrivals that have been choking the province's infrastructure and driving up the cost of living for residents. Now, it needs to be made clear that the protesters came into the country on the understanding that they were temporary students. Except that studying clearly was never their intention. They were looking for an easy back door, and once that back door was slammed shut, they hit the streets in a fit. Such a fit that outside of their threat to starve themselves with a hunger strike, the best they could threaten residents with is this. The people of PEI will also be affected because now they'll have to wait 20 minutes for a cup of coffee. Okay. <laughs> Wow, we're really going to have to rethink the support on that one. The protest group's leader had the following three demands as part of their mission. First, we demand to be grandfathered into the provincial nominee program system because we were already here, working on valid work permit before the new rules were implemented. It is only fair that those who were present before the changes be allowed to continue under the old system. Well, you know what's funny? If you're protesting in the streets, you're not in any position to be making demands. This is the language of entitlement. Ordinarily, I might be inclined to agree with the spirit of this demand, but given that they're on temporary student visas and therefore not citizens of Canada, they have no choice but to accept their fate. And we continue with the second one. Secondly, we call for fair PNP draws without a point system. Recently, sales and service, food sectors, and even truckers have been excluded from the PNP draws, despite our hard work and contributions. We deserve the same opportunities as other sectors, and the current point system, which requires 65 points, is nearly impossible for those under 25 to achieve. When it comes to unskilled labor, we really have no choice but to protect homegrown members of these sectors over non-residents. And this also lends itself to what Earl Nightingale always said about having value to offer. This is the luck of the draw. And we move on to the third demand. Lastly, we demand an extension to our work permits. Due to the government's changes and economic issues, our work permits were effectively wasted, causing many of us to lose our jobs. It is only fair that our work permits be renewed to compensate for the lost time and opportunities. You know, to be honest, I do feel for some of them on this last point simply because quite a few of them were left holding the bag. It is true that in the game of musical chairs, some will have to eat hay while others simply slip through the cracks and 
you know, get to carry on. But if you look at the gold rushes of the past, the Canadian citizenship gold rush is no different. There was an abundance of promise for those seeking new fortunes and coming to Canada until there simply weren't any anymore. The fate of those who got snagged by that 25% reduction is, quite honestly, a cost of doing business. They decided to roll the dice on a new opportunity, and it didn't work out. And then we have another problem that isn't helping. Or, you know, maybe perhaps it is. Uh, we've got some branches of the Indian media, and I'm using that term very lightly in this case, trying to smear Canada whenever something doesn't go their way. So as you can see here in this piece, if you want to call it that, there's no actual journalism. All you're seeing is one big, elongated version of the headlines question. No solutions are offered, it's just a way to tap into some cheap traffic to rake in those Google AdSense dollars. Check this out. Look at this YouTube page. You see that? We've got people. You see that? We've got news outlets, once again, using that. By the way, if you guys are sick of these kind of online rags trying to stoke the fire, you can always buy some bot traffic and send it to their websites. Once Google detects this traffic, they'll be banned from the AdSense program and lose their advertising income. Now, it needs to be said that PEI is a blue province, so I don't believe we'll see their action setting a new guideline for other premiers to follow. But it is encouraging to see a provincial government step up when the federal government that keeps aggravating this mess refuses to do their part to clean it up. So you tell me, do you feel the protesters in PEI got a raw deal, or do you think this is a much-needed step in the right direction? Leave your opinion in the comments. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. We are the only one who are suffering up because of houses crisis. We haven't seen nobody else joining us here who are suffering because of these rules changes. If there was houses crisis, why was ruled, rules only changed for immigrants? This is where my, my brother, he has property to his name. I, I am like, I co-signed it, right? Uh, I have my name in the property in Canada. I own some land. I paid my share in it. Unchecked mass immigration, runaway inflation, and a brutal real estate market. Trudeau's Canada is looking a little dystopian these days, and brighter days don't seem anywhere nearby. Sunny ways, my friends. Sunny ways. I asked my father which of the two Trudeaus is worse, Justin or his father Pierre. After all, both men have their share of flaws and are also reputed for being quite uncooperative, headstrong idealists. While my father considered both to be quite equally bad, he does credit Pierre with being the slightly more intelligent of the two. After all, the elder Trudeau can be credited with the establishment of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and thanks to that charter, we've experienced an increase in gender equality, improved protections for the French language and culture, as well as the adoption of gay marriage. Justin, on the other hand, appears destined to leave politics with a very negative legacy. Those policies of his, which have driven up the cost of living and killed the dream of home ownership for millions of Canadians, appears poised to create a new trend. And this trend will bring a great deal of harm to Canada and bring further damage to the country's productivity. So this legacy that Justin Trudeau is destined to carry out is the forthcoming Great Canadian Exodus. Just check it out if you go on YouTube... Discord, Reddit, or any other online forums, you'll find that they're teeming with Canadians voicing their intention to leave the country. Now, there are some Canadians who are buckling down and desperately waiting for the next federal election, and they believe that the Polyev Conservatives will right all these liberal wrongs. But the thing is, some of these problems we're facing now cannot be fixed by anyone, regardless of political stripe. For instance, history has shown us that once inflation drives up costs, those costs become the new standard. So, if a fast food burger cost you three bucks prior to the pandemic, and now that same burger costs seven bucks, then that will be the new baseline price. It might not go up again for a little while, but that will likely be the lowest you'll ever get it. And then there's Canada's housing problem, and that has no easy fix in sight. Even with the best of intentions, Polyev's government won't be able to produce the manpower required to build all the homes our country needs to return to affordability. 
And even if he could, there's all that red tape that comes with each tier of government when it comes to property development. And finally, we've got the mass immigration problem, which ties directly into the exodus crisis we are going to be facing. Canadians have paid a hefty price for their education and have worked hard to elevate themselves in the fields of work they study to be a part of. Those professionals invested in themselves and worked hard to achieve the Canadian dream. So it makes all the sense in the world for them to be frustrated and to hear that they're preparing to seek out the Canadian dream somewhere else. And once they start leaving, we are going to have a disastrous domino effect. Businesses will start to feel the pain of losing these skilled professionals. And with a poor healthcare system, excessive taxation, and a ridiculously high cost of living, these businesses are going to struggle hard to attract foreign talent to offset the exodus. In fact, some of these businesses just might move to other countries themselves. Home prices will finally drop, but that drop won't be favorable as the homes will be bought up by groups of unskilled immigrants. And this will lead to the creation of ghettos across Canada, as well as put further stress on our already depleted resources and infrastructure. So what direction do you see Canada going in? Do you believe some of Trudeau's damage can be repaired? Or do you believe Canada is permanently changed for the worse? and you yourself are prepared to leave the country. Have your say in the comments. Thank you very much for watching and do consider subscribing. Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. The Indian protesters in PEI failed in their attempts at a hunger strike. The whole initiative, of course, was laughable to begin with. When this whole thing started, their initial threat was to go on a 24 hour hunger strike. That's not a hunger strike. That's called fasting. I've done tons of 24 hour fasts throughout my life and the longest I've been able to fast was for 60 hours. So after the public laughed them out of the room for threatening to go on a fast, the group shifted the goalposts and went with what they called a dry hunger strike. Admittedly, going without liquids for an extended period of time can actually be damaging. Honestly, I can't say I believe they went fully dry though. There is zero doubt in my mind they were sneaking liquids in on the sly. Apparently, their hunger strike was paused when Jeff Young, the director of the Provincial Office of Immigration, asked them to give his office time to review their options. The leader of the protests, Rupinder Pal Singh, who I've done a couple of videos about, look for the links to those videos in the video description, had this to say. They have all the information they require. Now, we are just waiting for answers. As the government is cooperating with us, definitely we will be doing the same thing and we are going to pause the ongoing hunger strike as requested and encouraged by the government. It seems like they received the message and they are working on it and definitely the ball is in their court only. So we will be expecting more positive answers sooner. Now he's not wrong about what he said about the message. If PI's assembly caves on this, it puts out a very bad message. And that message is that Canada is a nation of simps. We're telling the world that anyone can manipulate us and we'll roll over for even the smallest of threats. It's now about to happen in Ontario as well. Take a look at this. It's a poster being floated to promote the coming protests in Ontario for workers to be able to stay beyond their agreed upon terms. This is what the message is putting out. And they've been public about this. They've been public about saying they've been inspired by what they've seen in PEI. So you see, this is why we've really, really got to make sure we buckle down on this. If you look at the bottom of the poster, you'll see one of the points of protest is to stop what they call LMIA-based exploitation. We will cover LMIA in greater detail in a future video, but I strongly suggest you look it up to get an idea of how entitled this movement is and how utterly disconnected from reality they happen to be. Now, moving on. No one was monitoring their hunger strike closely, so they could have been cheating the whole time, and it's disgraceful. And it's not only disgraceful to Canadians, but to Indians who actually know how to put on a real hunger strike. And I'm referring to none other than Mahatma Gandhi. Throughout his years as an activist, Gandhi had led several hunger strikes. And when he did, this guy meant business. Gandhi also has two 21-day hunger strikes under his belt. One of those was meant to foster better relations between Hindus and Muslims. The other 21-day hunger strike was to protest the brutality of British colonialism. And let me tell you, there is a stark difference between the British troops who occupied India and the Canadians these protesters claim are trampling on their right. The British colonialists were absolutely brutal. Many of them barely saw Indians as human, which was demonstrated with the way they abrogated their rights. They subjugated them in their own homeland. 
Canadians, on the other hand, have been very warm and welcoming. And as we've seen through social media and the news, many Canadians have given the protesters and PEI their full support. I'm bringing all of this up to illustrate just how soft our nation is getting. You look at what a noble man like Gandhi put himself through to achieve a worthy mission and the sizable risks he took to accomplish them. And then you compare that to a bunch of fraudulent, entitled hucksters looking to game the system, launching into childish theatrics when they get called out. So here's hoping the powers that be in PI hold the line, because if they don't, we're in serious trouble, especially with a guy like Mark Miller controlling the flow of immigration. So thank you very much for watching, and if you haven't done so already, please do consider subscribing. After seeing the amount of attention garnered by the Indian protesters in PEI, a small army of temporary foreign workers are preparing to do the same in Ontario. And if the numbers they state they have are to be believed, you can be sure what's going to go down in Ontario will be quite substantial. The movement is being spearheaded by the Najawan Support Network, which is based in Brampton. The same battle to keep temporary workers in the country permanently will begin on June 4th. The thing about the NSN is it actually has noble intentions at its root. The organization was created to stop the exploitation of temporary foreign workers, which is more than fair. But here's the kicker. Pretty much all of the businesses they go after for unpaid wages or illegally low wages happen to be owned by members of their own community. After seeing how their colleagues fared in PEI, the NSN now believes it can succeed where they fell short. And given who's bankrolling them, I can't say they're wrong. This month, one of the NSN's members, Lovepreet Singh, was brought in to speak at a convention for one of the most powerful unions in the country. The people who are backing the NSN's movement is QP. QP is the bane of every level of government in the country. They're one of the very reasons the cost of living in Canada continues going up, and they've been doing that long before the pandemic reared its ugly head. So why would they have an interest in backing this coming movement? Have you ever seen the kind of money that unions make? The NSN is claiming that up to 70,000 workers will be facing deportation. Now imagine if QP could add those temporary workers to their ranks. We're talking about a fat payday for QP. Once again, it's the Canadian taxpayer who's on the hook for someone else's agenda. The Liberals want more TFWs to increase their voter base. You're the one paying for that. Corrupt businesses want more TFWs to cheap out on labor. In doing so, they're screwing Canadian taxpayers twice in the process. And now, QP wants a piece of the exploitation pie as well, and you're the one who's going to pay for it. So what are your ideas or solutions to this problem? Be sure to leave those ideas in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and if you haven't done so already, please do consider subscribing. Look at our streets. Look what has become of our streets. And this is all because of people not having anywhere to go. I spoke to someone from here, and he's an international student. And the persons who he was supposed to come up with, they have basically probably got to an altercation, he said and they don't want them to him to live with him anymore. And they're mostly um, males that are here. But this shouldn't be allowed to be happening here. They came up as international students. There must be somewhere that they can go. From this end, all the way down to where the sign is, Persons experiencing homelessness are there and they're international students. <sighs> but look, pillows. Nobody needs to see this or want this or live like this. This should not be allowed. I want to know what our government is doing, what our mayor is doing to help this situation. International students, how did they get here? How did they get here and why is it that they're here now and nowhere to live? Where are the people that said they will keep them until they finish their education and return to their countries or to their homes? Because we're all immigrants here. My concern is they have nowhere to go or they have somewhere to go but things have happened and they cannot stay there no more. Where can they go? What, what can, where can they go? The mayor of Rampton, where can they go? They are all living behind these trees. Not just now, they've been there for a while. This is too much now.
What is the mayor of Brampton doing? On the Canadian government website, if you go on the federal website, there's three words written largely on the flyers, on the pamphlets, on the web pages. Study, work, stay. There are people who say, oh, international students, they sign a letter, they say they're not gonna stay. But the marketing of the country from this government itself tells students, you can study here, you can work here, you can stay here. So the reason we're here today is to actually say to the government, honor your word, honor your promises. And so since COVID, we've seen that international students, new immigrants held up the entire economy. When a lot of Canadians were at home to isolate from COVID, it was international students, it was immigrants who were going out into the warehouses, onto the streets, in their cars and their bikes and their trucks to work under dangerous conditions. And even after COVID, we are still working and this entire country, this entire economy runs on the backs of immigrants. There is no question about that. During COVID for international students, we saw that there was a 20 hour policy and they lifted the 20 hour policy. Why? Because Canadians weren't willing to work at that time. So they lifted the policy so that students could work full time. They used to say, oh, well, you have to focus on your studies. You can only work 20 hours. But during COVID, our studies didn't matter. The labor market mattered more than our studies, right? So what we saw during COVID was, it was clear the Canadian government can change their policies, can change the immigration system according to their own economic needs. Plan B. People are a resource. They can use us and then they can discard us. So they started giving PR, TR to PR pathways. But what we're seeing now, and the main problem is, that international students who have completed their study permit are now on their work permit, which is anywhere between eight months to two years or three years. And now their work permits are expiring. And over the last several years, we've seen that processing of permanent residency files has slowed. There's been a backlog. And some of those promises, some of those expectations that new immigrants and students had uh, have been challenged. So now there's this backlog, there's this unpredictability, and tens of thousands of students are now facing mass deportations in the coming year or two because the government has been inconsistent, unpredictable, and unfair to international students and immigrant workers. And so we are here today to demand an extension of postgraduate work permits, alongside a demand to stop exploitation through the LMIA system, and to demand a fair pathway to PR. And our main slogan here today is, if we are good enough to work, if you wanna squeeze our labor out of us, we are also good enough to stay. We have a right to work and live here in dignity, in safety, with good wages, and to bring our families here and settle. And I will say this, this country needs immigrants. This is a retiring, aging population of mainly Europeans who need a new generation of people to keep working and holding up the economy. The Canadian government's data tells us this. And so over the next couple of years, there will continue to be a labor shortage. So when the government says, well, we're gonna kick you out, we're gonna bring new students in, and every year they make us pay four times the tuition fees, what they're saying is, we want an endless supply of cheap labor, but we don't want you to stay here and have access to health care and education and all of the other rights that citizens have. The outtakes for today's video comes to us courtesy of Maple Live Vancouver TV. You can find a link to their socials in the description below. Now let's get right into it. So what's your name? Kesha. Yeah. Where are you from? Punjab, India. What brought you to Canada? So I'm here for the studying and mostly for the PR like 
Mm-hmm. That's everybody, every international student's dream. So Right off the bat, we've got a huge problem here. I mean, there was a time when people used to try covering up when they were breaking the law, but our dude here clearly does not give a damn. And that's part of the problem right there in terms of why gaming the system keeps happening. If you're seeing hundreds of people around you laughing it off, you eventually get the message that it's really not as serious a crime as it's made out to be. So in terms of future jobs that you would like to do after you graduate, what are you looking for? I'm an Andrew Tate fan, so jobs are for losers. Pardon? Oh my god, I swear to god, the first time I heard this clip, I actually thought this kid might be trolling the audience. I mean, if it wasn't so serious, it would actually be hilarious. You have no idea how I wish someone would ambush Mark Miller with this clip the next time he's holding a presser. The best, however, is the interviewer's reaction. Pardon? Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. Yeah, the Romanian guy. The bald guy. Tell me why you want to be like Andrew Tate. Yes, young sir. Please do tell us why you want to be like Andrew Tate. And for that matter, be sure to repeat everything you say in this interview with your case officer the next time you guys meet. So watch this next part. The interviewer can't even be bothered to conceal her reaction. He says to escape the matrix. Matrix is like a bubble made by the government. Like just to be in there, to be slaves, they give you money to work for themselves 9 to 5. That's it. I want, I want to be get rich. Do you have any advice for anyone that's um, kind of wanting to come to Canada? Just don't come, go to another country. Like right now, Canada, the housing is too expensive. <laughs> I can say anything. <laughs> I think this is the only point I agree with him on. He is right. The cost of living is completely off the hook, but at the same time, you have to wonder why he picked Vancouver of all places. Rentals in Metro Vancouver are beyond unaffordable. I mean, did he not take the time before coming over to research rent rates across the country and pick a cheaper town or city to live in? Either way, well, there you have it. We have a severe shortage of doctors. We don't have nearly enough manpower to build the tens of millions of homes required to fix the housing crisis. But you know what? Those are people who work jobs. Doctors, being a doctor is a job. Working in construction, that's a job. And what we've learned today is that jobs are for losers. <laughs> this country is done. Once again, do check out Maple Life Vancouver's channel. Links are in the description. Thank you very much for watching. And if you haven't done so already, please do consider subscribing. So I had a completely different video ready to go for you guys today, but news just came up and I felt a need to jump all over this instead since it's an issue that we've covered in the past. Now, before we tear into this very, very juicy news, I need to ask you guys for one thing, and that is to please subscribe to this channel so that I can get a very big announcement out to you. If you're on any kind of social media, you're well aware there is a concerted campaign to get rid of voices that oppose mass immigration. And this channel is no different. So I will be taking some safety precautions. I will be coming out with this announcement sometime this week, but subscribing to this channel is your best chance to get the notice once the announcement comes out. All right, so now let's dig in. What we're gonna do is we are going to start with a video shot by the migrant protesters in PI. Hello everybody, we today wanted to inform you about the eviction notice that we have got from the Legislative Assembly. So, we are asked to be evicted on Friday, this coming Friday, and the next step would be they will be involving the police in this matter. This would have never happened if we had more support from our brothers and sisters. So we are seeking for more support and if they are going to evict us, we need more support. Otherwise, they will be evicting us very easily. And also there is going to be a counter protest from the PPC party, People's Party of Charlottetown. So we need your support in that as well, as uh, there are many less people who are coming in and supporting us. And if there are less people, all over 30 days of protest that we have done before, all um, all of our uh, hard work is going to be in vain. If, if you guys don't support us or come tomorrow, it is going to be a counter protest from 12 to 3. So it's a really a humble request for all of us, all of us to join together and uh, be a part of the protest so that we can show our uh, strength and show our power so that they cannot evict us. Don't you just love how they can't even get the PPC's acronym right? The People's Party of Charlottetown? Anyways, this is it, folks. PI has stood its ground and the so-called international students who tried to scam their way in have been shut down. 
The first gripe they have is that they need more support. I guess irony is not their strong suit. They tried to game the system and gain citizenship through fraudulent means. And in doing so, they drove up PEI's housing costs. They drove up unemployment. And then they actually wonder why no one wants to throw them a bone. So they're giving it one last shot by staging what they call a blackout. And what that essentially means is that more than 300 of these uh, protesters will be taking a day off from their jobs to continue reinforcing their demands. I saw one of them state somewhere that what they hope to accomplish with this is to make drive through lineups unbearably long to wait through. It's just like, have you been to a drive through these days? It's protest or no protest. That's just the way they are. You're threatening people with what they're already suffering through. So I don't think that's going to work. These protesters have demonstrated nothing but selfishness since this entire debacle began. They have nothing but contempt for the locals. They clearly don't respect the rule of law. When anybody voices their opposition, they label them as racists, try to get them shut down on social media, and otherwise silence. There was even one instance where the organizer of the PI protest tried to get the local police to arrest Harrison Faulkner of the True North Media for reporting on their activities. So stay tuned to this channel as the final protest is taking place today as I record this video. And then after that, the police will be evicting them from their campground. They say they're planning an additional hunger strike on top of this, but after they're evicted, I just don't see how that hunger strike could have any kind of an impact whatsoever, given that no one will be around to see it. I'll also be following up on the counter protest that will be meeting them today. So once again, I strongly recommend that you subscribe to this channel so you can receive that big announcement that's coming, and I thank you very much for watching. By now it appears as though liberals and the people who vote for them are the only ones who cannot understand how harmful mass immigration is to our economy. Now, one quick thing before we delve into this video, I've been teasing an announcement the past couple of days. This announcement has to do with the increasing levels of censorship that affect not just right-leaning channels, but even center-right channels. I'm currently building a workaround to that problem, and the best way for you to get notified of that workaround is to subscribe to this channel. Now, let's take a look at an affair lobby group trying to inflict more damage to our economy for their own personal gain. The lobby group we're talking about is the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association, who we'll be referring to as SILA. SILA was founded in 2020 by immigration lawyers from across the country. I'm mentioning the date the organization was formed because if you look at this chart here, you'll clearly see why they have such a vested interest in lobbying. Take a good look at that spike in immigration levels. Notice how the rate of immigrants literally doubled within a year of the group's inception? You can bet a good deal of that increase has to do with the several meetings Sila has with Mark Miller each year. It's also worth reminding you that prior to his current role as a Liberal MP, Mark Miller was himself a lawyer. Now if Sila had their way, that dystopian vision of the future Christopher Freeland painted to sell her capital gains tax would no doubt become a reality. Sila's proposals would effectively amputate what remains of the safeguards for an effective and beneficial immigration program. So what exactly are the proposals that would be so detrimental? First, they recommend that the government repeal a key rule concerning medical inadmissibility. Even before we hear what this proposed measure is, the fact that they have to do with health is already a bad sign. They want to eliminate legislation that considers foreign nationals ineligible if it's determined their health condition is likely to be a danger to public health and safety or may place excessive demand on health and social services. This means foreign nationals would no longer be disqualified from coming to Canada regardless of their medical condition. We are in the midst of a crippling healthcare crisis. We do not have enough medical personnel to take care of the existing population. We even have people with severe injuries sitting in emergency waiting rooms for hours. And here is Sila proposing that we remove a fail-safe that would protect what little there's left of our healthcare system. They also want to do away with financial qualification. If someone intending to immigrate to Canada lacks the required funds to do so, Sila wants to see to it that officers consider not only the applicant's family for funding, but also his or her entire social network. Our immigration program is already overwhelmed with fraud. This is the reason so many scammers coming in on the false pretense of being international students are working 60 hours a week instead of studying. It's already too easy for applicants to borrow money and park it in their bank accounts to meet the financial requirements. Now just imagine how insane our immigration levels would get if all an applicant needed was a letter from the local sports team they play for saying they'd act as a guarantor. It's just too easy. Now this next one is really going to boil your blood when you hear it. 
because if it did come into play, not only would it saturate our infrastructure like all of Silo's other proposals, it would also remove all ethical standards we expect from Canadian. Here it is. Silo wants to lower penalties for misrepresentation. Anyone found guilty of falsifying information on their application faces a minimum five-year ban from reapplying. Silo wants that reduced to one year. What's worrisome is that Mark Miller has already demonstrated his openness to continually moving the goalposts further apart. At the time this video is being made, the Liberals still have 16 months left on their clock. That's enough time to enact policies which will have an irreparable effect on Canada. If you find this concerning, be sure to bring it to your MP's attention and tell them you want to see them do their part to block these measures proposed by Sila. Thank you very much for watching, and please do consider subscribing.